the, in the 1990 World Cup, the, the day before the Germany game in the semi final, we uh, Bob Lawson did the team talk, and then um, he just turned around and he says, You know, tonight, uh, plenty of rest because it's an important game tomorrow, semi final World Cup. And uh, he always used to hide in as well, remember the war. So um, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I said to Chris Wall, I look because I was room with him, I'm just going for a walk. And I heard these two guys playing tennis, so I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind a game of tennis. Um, so I asked the two guys for a game, they went, yeah, so I saw taking the two of them on. And uh, I was getting a little bit tired, I'd been playing about an hour or something, and I heard someone shouting Gaza, and it was the gaffer. So Bobby Robson, I'm thinking, oh no, I'm in trouble. And as he come in, I'm like, looked at him and sort of apologised, and uh, he walked past me and went absolutely blessed with the two Americans, went, can you not believe it? Do you know he's got the most important game in his life tomorrow? And they're like, didn't know what they were talking about. Do you not know who he is and that? By this time, I dropped the racket and run, run back to my room. I went to Chris, I'm in bed, I'm jumping. And Chris went, where you been? I went, doesn't matter. And uh, Bob Robson called Brian on the door and said, Chris, open the door. And Chris, I turned to Chris, I went, tell him I'm sleeping. He went, oh, guys are sleeping. He went, no, he's not. He's just been playing tennis. I'm, I, just, I still imagine, I still see Chris's face looking at him. like, have you been playing tennis? I went, yeah. And uh, d wouldn't open the door to him, but a sheet of paper came underneath the door and he said, I'll see you in the morning. So the next morning he pulled us and he went, I can't believe he did that. And I went, well, I couldn't sleep. He went, do you know you're playing against Matthias tomorrow, today? He said, you know, he's the best midfield player in the world. I went, no, I am. One day we had a day off and Bobby Robson decided to take all for golf. Now I wasn't really bothered about playing golf. Um, frustrating, he takes ages for having another shot, you know, and um, he, he demanded that everyone played, so. I remember it was so hot as well, and I took my top off, you know, playing golf and no top on. And I remember Bobby Robson screaming, shouting, get your top back on, you know, because there's got to be lots of etiquette in golf. And I'm, I suppose that's not, that's not me. And um, as we're driving along, see, but Mac Moore, I'm in, in the buggy car with him. He was driving, and he says, oh, poking the same one around the hill. So as I've leaned outside the car, the buggy car, looked over, and he's drove through a tree. And the branch I said was right in the chest, and I've actually done a back somersault, hitting his chest, hitting me chest, you know. Uh, winded us a little bit, and we're, I can see the funny side of it. It was just, you know, one of them pranks that's, he was quite funny as well, Steve Mac, one of, me, you know, one of the pranks he did on me. Um, I was in pain a little bit, but I didn't let uh, the Super Bobby know. But we used to get the Dr. Crane come round, and uh, he used to give everyone a bottle of chocolate. And um, me and Chris used to love it. and. Um, we get a bar of chocolate and Peter Beach just come to my room we just, just eat the chocolate and that. And I fancied a bit more and I knew like sort of Terry Butcher probably might not have wanted chocolate, you know, being a tough man. And uh, I waited till about half past 12 and I went to his room, you know, I could hear him still asleep and that. And I went to his fridge to get his uh, bar of chocolate and he heard us. And I've just grabbed the chocolate. <laughs> and uh, I, I was chasing up the corridor at half past one in the morning. Half past one in the morning, chasing up the car, I want his chocolate back, and then I, Chris, Chris Woods uh, cornered us off, and I remember Chris just bouncing an orange off the back of my head, you know, and he, I just heard Terry shout, yeah, I'll see you in the morning, but he was okay the next morning. Was he one of the, like, the, the, he was one of the senior... Yeah, senior but Terry was, Terry was brilliant, he was just as mad as me in the World Cup, you know, he would, yeah, he, Terry was great, he'd do loads of daft things, you know, just to keep, keep the spirit up in the World Cup, you know. We played Belgium, and uh, I was up against Chifo, that guy destroyed us in that game. I must have hold my hands up that he was brilliant in that game, even though I set up Platt for the goal. But I remember going for a tackle near him, and I sort of I thought I'd won the ball a little bit. It was only slightly a little bit from behind, but um, I remember it rolling all over the place. And um, so I mimicked, mimicked him rolling all over, and uh, the referee actually booked us, you know, and I was devastated. And the main thing I did, didn't want to do was actually get booked because I knew I'd miss the, the World Cup final if we actually got there. But to get booked in the semi-final was horrendous, you know, I was absolutely devastated, as you can see on TV, you know. Um, but, you know, when I come back from the World Cup, it was amazing because, you know, I would like to think I, I brought the attention of football back into, back into the country, you know. It was all women coming up to us in the 70s and 80s and little kids as, as three and four-year-olds looking up and seeing me name, that's guys and that. So, you know, it was, sometimes it was great to be in the World Cup, but for that time and that moment to get the yellow, second yellow card, it was horrendous, you know. And, Probably one of my saddest moments in my career. And tell us about what, what there's a famous shot of Gary Lineker with his doing the eye. What, what, what was he? What was yeah, well, Gary was trying to get us, you know, to pull around quickly, you know, and I was just ignoring him. I mean, my head was just blank. It is blank normally anyway, so it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, Gary was just trying to, you know, get us to come around and concentrate in the game, and I was just not, not listening to him. 
And obviously, it's only me as well when I've seen him back on camera where he's had a word with Sir Bobby and to have a word with him, you know. Um, which was nice of him there to care, but after a couple of minutes, I thought, you know, if I'm not going to get there, I want the lads to go there. So, I, you know, I, I tried me hardest for the last 20 minutes and uh, won, unfortunately, win that, you know, with Chris Waddle hitting the post. Um, I was up to take one of the penalties, but, you know, me, I wasn't in the right frame of mind. And um, so Peter Beardsley took my penalty for us and he scored, so that was a relief. He's always good at penalties anyway, Peter. But Chris Waddle, I remember poor Chris going up and he, you know, he's hit that penalties. Went over the bar and I went so far to end up in the crowd. And the guy that actually found it, because we flew back to Luton, and the, the guy came up and said, Chris, you know, I've got the ball he missed the penalty with. And I remember Chris turned around and saying to him, God, I know I missed the penalty, but I didn't know it went as far as Luton. David Platt, when he was in the England squad, all he ever talked about, it wasn't about the next game, but it was like Doug Ellis. Oh, Doug Ellis has got this, Aston Villa, Doug Ellis this, Doug Ellis that, and it was driving me nuts. So any time David Platt talked, I went, who, Doug Ellis? So we were like, oh, Paul, that was a good goal, who? Who scored it? Doug Ellis. So Bobby Robson gives a day off in Sardinia and uh, there's all the players and some of the waves and that. And uh, I've seen I've seen a boat out about f I don't know, a couple of hundred yards. So I come on, let's swim for a bit. And as we're swimming, it was me, Bully, um, Linica, his wave, all come out and that. And uh, and I just shouted for a laugh, oh, Doug Ellis in his yacht. And it was him. It was hilarious. And uh, I swim, we swam there as quick as we could. And uh, we got on the boat and um, I had a look and he just said he had about 30 bottles of good champagne. And then uh, I remember seeing the guy in his wife, come up the stairs, come up the top of the deck. I said, it's lovely. I said, come up the top of the deck. And I run and dived on, dived, put me on form, smash. And the next, I'd done a somersault and just missed the edge of the board. And then Gary was too happy. Um, then he went back on a little dinghy back, speed dinghy with a little engine on the back to the, to the beach, you know. And I said, the lads, come on, we'll have to swim back. They went, no, Paul, you'll never swim back. I said, no, I will be, man, I'll be all right. I remember diving in. And I was, uh, <laughs> I remember swimming, I must have got 100 yards and I was shattered and I thought, right, I'll go to the bottom, get me, take deep breath, go to the bottom, push myself up and swim like mad, make it in. But actually, as I went down, I spun round and I swam as quick as I could and I was swimming back out to sea. Uh, by this time, I was struggling, like, you know. Um, luckily enough, Flinnick, I seen it and he's waving and I jumped back in the speedboat, a little uh, dinghy speedboat and uh, come and saved us and pulled us back on board. I don't know why I did it, like, considered I nearly like, killed his wife half an hour beforehand, but that was a great, I remember a great time. And that, when we got back, we told Platty, like, we've seen Doug Ellis in his yacht and that. So Platty was made up. Mm -hmm.